Welcome to The Bright Side of Longevity. Join Dr. Roger Landry and guests as they discuss the bright side of getting older through healthy longevity. Guided by research, this lighthearted and educational discussion will leave you with practical tips and ways to impact your lifestyle to brighten life's journey. California-born consultant turned photographer Doug Adams began his work on staff at the Peace Corps, where he trained volunteers to prepare for their service in Central and South America. After completing his master's with a specialization in organizational behavior from Harvard University, he worked as a consultant with McKinsey & Company in New York and London, director of leadership development at Pepsi-Cola, vice president at Computer Vision Corporation, and in 1985, Doug launched his own management consulting firm, MDA Associates, and developed an international practice working with organizations in over 30 countries. Fascinated by the diverse neighborhoods in New York City, he turned to photography in his retirement and has exhibited his work in Asia, New York, Cape Cod, and Boston. He is currently the Board of Governors of the Copley Society of Art in Boston and also serves on its art committee. In addition, he currently serves on the board of directors of the Harvard Club of Cape Cod. everybody. Welcome to the Bright Side of Longevity. I'm here with my esteemed colleague and young sage, Danielle. Hello, Danielle. Hey, Dr. Roger. How are you doing today? Uh, very well. I heard things are hot down where you are in Florida today. And yeah. Yep. Real feel was 108 yesterday, 107 today. So stay inside where it's air conditioned. Well, our guest uh, spends time in Florida, but uh, luckily he's a fellow caper like me, Cape Cod, and he's where he should be <laughs> in Cape Cod today. Uh, Doug Adams is going to join us. Doug, welcome. So good to Thank have you. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you and Di Danielle. Doug and I uh, work together. I'm uh, privileged to have uh, do some work with him. Uh, we work in scheduling events, but uh, mostly we just get to uh, go to meetings together and trade stories, not lies, I guess, just stories. <laughs> well, probably a little of both. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, but Doug, we're so pleased to have you here. We wanted to explore um, we, a, a number of subjects post COVID, but you know, how careers change and everything changed. But w one thing we wanted to explore was COVID initiated a lot of earlier retirements than people expected. And it was also somewhat precipitous relative to the transition that some people went through. Here they were, going concerns, big jobs, high power jobs, many people. And uh, all of a sudden that changed. I, you know, I don't know how, how high, high powered I was, but mine changed significantly. And so I'm uh, familiar with that. But I think you experienced it uh, exponentially uh, in a greater way because of what you did. So uh, that we'd like to explore what you were doing before and how you what the transition was like and how uh, what you did to get to the obvious great place where you are right now and what role maybe creativity had in that also. So that's our goal today. Sound good? Sounds great. I'm glad to uh, be able to contribute. Well, great. Well, then we should start with what you were doing. You were a management consultant, international. Uh, could you describe what life was like uh, before COVID and your, your career? Yes. Um, boy, it brings back all kinds of memories. In fact, I just got chills. <laughs> I, uh, I worked in the corporate world uh, for about 10 or 15 years, uh, 
first of all, at an international management consulting firm, uh, McKinsey and Company, after I finished my graduate work and uh, worked around the world with McKinsey and was there three or four years. Uh, and then I was recruited by Pepsi-Cola to go be the director of leadership development for Pepsi. Uh, which at the time, by the way, had a reputation in the corporate world as being one of the best uh, at developing leaders and executives and so on uh, in the world. So it was a great opportunity. And I, I spent a number of years at Pepsi and then I was uh, recruited by uh, Computer Vision Corporation, which took me back uh, to Boston, the Boston area uh, and I was at Computer Vision for five years as a vice president. Uh, and in 1985, uh, I decided that I wanted to leave the, the corporate world and start, and start my own business. And so I can remember that uh, one Friday evening, I left the corporate world and my assistant, my administrator, my staff, all kinds of resources. And on Monday morning at eight o'clock, I went in our spare bedroom <laughs> with a telephone. And that was, that was my first day as an independent consultant. And uh, as luck would have it, the CEO that I had just left called me and said, Doug, we have problems in in uh, the Netherlands, would you be willing to go and do, you know, X, Y, Z? And I said, of course. So I did, and one thing led to another. And uh, I had always been a natural networker. So I had a net worldwide network of friends and colleagues and clients and former clients. So, uh, and that provided kind of a natural uh, marketing uh, world for me, and things kind of took off, and I uh, began to uh, work for a lot of clients in the greater Boston area, uh, high tech and biotech and financial services, uh, and one of my clients uh, quickly became Gillette, uh, and I ended up working in 20 different countries for Gillette. Uh, and uh, another Boston area company was Bose, the speaker company. And uh, I got a call one day from Dr. Bose. He said, Doug, I hear from my staff that you uh, are a good problem solver. <laughs> and so uh, make a long story short, I went out to see him and proceeded to do work for him and Bose for a number of years. Uh, I think one of the things that I'm most proud and pleased with in my consulting career was that uh, a number of major clients, including Gillette and Citibank and uh, Sony Music and uh, Bose, was that I maintained those relationships for decades and did work for them over decades. And I think that was a a, a, a testament to my work and uh, building good, healthy relationships. Clearly. Uh, <clears throat> so I uh, was doing work for the uh, CEO of the time called The Limited, which owned 12 retail chains, including Victoria's Secret and, mm -hmm. and Express and Bath and Body Works and blah, blah, blah. And he said, Doug, I need you to come to Columbus, Ohio to run a three-day workshop team building for uh, my the 12 heads of their retail businesses. So I did. And one of the participants in that program that I did in Columbus, Ohio, was the chairman of their primary manufacturer, which was in Sri Lanka. And at the end of the three days, the chairman of this company said, came up to me and he said, Doug, you know, this was great. Could you do this for me in Sri Lanka with my team? 
I said, of course. <laughs> Uh, I said, in fact, I'm going to be in that part of the world in next, you know, in a week or two, doing some work for Gillette, and I'll stop by. <laughs> that stop was in, by. I'll stop <laughs> by. <laughs> and that was in 1994. And I went to Sri Lanka after I'd done work in Shanghai and Hong Kong for Gillette, and uh, did a, a program for him in Sri Lanka. And uh, that began a uh, relationship with his company that endured up to the pandemic. So from 94 yeah. to 2020, uh, what is that, 26 years? Yeah. I, I worked and I helped him build his company from 28 million in revenue to 2 billion. And from a single country in Sri Lanka to having operations in 14 countries. Uh, and it, it got my reputation out in Asia. And so he said, you know, Doug, I'm on the uh, Family Company Institute board headquartered in Singapore. Could you come and do a presentation to this institute? I said, of course. So I did that and I did a number of other things and I became quite by accident, kind of a specialist in working with Asian CEOs. Mm -hmm. And so I did that uh, in about a dozen Asian countries over the years. So- uh, so The moral yeah. of the lesson is make it, maintain good social networks and connections and say yes to every opportunity. Because not once he's like, sure, I'll be there next week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, uh, Danielle, I think that's that's right. Uh, I've always been fortunate to build good relationships and know that my clients will uh, want me to be around if they can trust me implicitly yep. and if they if I do good work. And uh, so building trust and strong interpersonal relationships uh, tended to be part of my uh, reputation. Wow. Uh, so I did this work uh, around the world, and I think in almost every country in Europe and a dozen countries in Asia, as well as, of course, the U.S. So... Uh, my work was really coaching executives, helping them identify the next generation of leaders, uh, putting in place systems and procedures uh, to do that, and to build a culture that was socially responsible, ethical, people-centered, uh, and values-based. And that's what I learned to do. And uh, I did it with startups in the high tech field to Citibank and these other large companies that I've mentioned. So it was a very personal, highly engaged uh, work that I did. And obviously very successful at it. That's uh, so that's uh, that you get a lot. You had a lot on your plate and you were being very successful, and then change came. Now, this could be, in a, for another person, this could be just retirement time, or it could be the pandemic, or it could be both. And so, uh, you know, there was that black cloud that none of us saw coming, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. So, so how did you, okay, so you're traveling around the world, you're making all these great connections, you're like, as successful, like at the peak of your career, and then all of a sudden the pandemic hits, and you're kind of cut off from that. So how did you make that transition? With great difficulty. So you can appreciate that. Uh, I just, I think this will tell you, I, I became a lifetime uh, platinum with Hilton hotels. And I became a, <laughs> Uh, the platinum level with Emirates Airlines. Uh, and uh, I got to know all the flight attendants on Emirates in Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> and so I 
it was Danielle, it was a it was a an exciting, engaging, self-affirming process uh, experience that I had with my work. Uh, and by the way, in over 120 trips to Asia during my career, uh, my wife went with me on a third of them. Nice. Uh, so And so we would go to Sri Lanka or India or China or Cambodia or wherever. And then when my work was done, we would hire a driver and just take off and spend a week or two, you know, seeing the world and me doing my photography. So it wasn't just a job. It was my life. Yeah. And I think that's important. Uh, and I'm getting emotional about this because mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a big deal. And so when COVID hit, uh, I was shocked. I was depressed. I had never experienced anything like that in my life. Uh, but I knew enough from my undergraduate studies in psychology and my graduate work in organizational behavior and the kind of work that I did, I knew that I needed to dig deep and explore who I was and what I could do to deal with my uh, incredible change and uh, law. And, and so one of the things that I did, because I learned this in graduate school from one of my key professors uh, who wrote a book about leadership called True North. And True North is who you are as a person, your values, your purpose, your priorities, uh, and understanding your true north is critical to being a genuine, effective leader and person. And one of the things that this professor did before he was an academic, he was a CEO of a large company, and he started true north groups where people would come together and share their life experience and learn together. So one of the things that I did was I started a men's group. Uh, well, first of all, I retire, I had to retire. And then we sold our condo in Back Bay in downtown Boston and moved to our summer home on Cape Cod. And that was a transition and change in and of itself. But one of the things that I did early on was to start a True North group. So I, I went to seven of my friends and I asked them if they would be interested in putting together this group. And they all said, absolutely. So I started this group in the purpose of which was to come together to share good times, to have a little scotch and vodka, to drink, have a great meal, and then to have me facilitate a 90-minute discussion about a subject that I felt we would all be dealing with in our retirement. So they were all kind of where I was in terms of retirement. And we are... In fact, our next meeting is next Tuesday. We've been meeting for four and a half years, once a month. Was that all and in it, person? Was it, was any of it online? All in person, Danielle. It's all in person. Uh, I think we skipped a few months during the heart of the pandemic, yeah. uh, but there were meetings where we wore masks and we were all vaccinated and whatever. Uh, and we kept our social distance for 18 months or so. But this has become uh, one of the most meaningful things in our lives. And uh, it's so, so, so this also goes to something that I learned uh, 
because one of the things that I've always done when I want to, when I'm going through change or want to make a change in my life or my career is I try to study, well, what have other people done? Uh, how have people done it successfully? Uh, and so I began to read about uh, retirement and, uh, uh, and, and successful aging and so on. Uh, but I wanna just drop back and say that in one of these men's group meetings, it struck me, uh, I was sharing with the group how difficult it was for me to not get on a airplane and fly to Dubai every other week and, and have Dr. Bose call me or my client in Sri Lanka call me and say, Doug, where are you? We need you. <laughs> Um, I was talking about that in the men's group and all of a sudden this, this term came to mind, which was a loss of significance. And that just kind of came out and I thought, oh my God, that's what I'm going through. Really? Yes. And you weren't alone either, were you? Right, right. But I, I think that was the beginning of the process through which I got in touch with what was going on with me emotionally and and personally and 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 professionally and I said okay if I've lost this significance what am I going to do to try to replace it with something that's meaningful and valuable and part of that was this men's group uh, and another part of it was turning to my photography in a way that I was unable to do when I was working 80 hours a week, you know, uh, and, uh, and joining the board of the Copley Society of Art in Boston, which is a very, it's, we're, we are the oldest nonprofit art organization in the United States. And our early members were people like Monet and, uh, and Manet and uh, really kind of high powered stuff. Never so heard of them. I, sorry. <laughs> I was joking. I said, never heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, but so now it's a very prominent uh, art uh, organization. We have 350 members around the world. And I'm one of those members and I'm on the board and it's very gratifying and engaging. So I began to do that. And that was the other reason, Roger, that I, when I got a call about, would you become a, a help out with the leadership of the Harvard Club of Cape Cod? I said, yes, because I knew that engagement and relationships like meeting you, Roger, and other people in the Harvard Club and the relationships I've developed in the Copley Society were important part of my kind of recovery, if you will, from this loss of significance, that I knew that I needed something substantively uh, and, and interpersonally uh, uh, engaging and rewarding uh, in my life. interesting because what we know of your photography, and I'd love to hear more about it, you had mentioned specifically that in New York City, you loved like the diverse populations and groups that you were seeing. So you were forced to connect to people in a different way. Can you talk a little bit about your photography specifically? Uh, I, I was working in the, for, uh, in the mayor's office in New York City. Uh, and that's not maybe as, as elite as it sounds, <laughs> because there were like 
150 people working in the in, in the office, and I was a pretty low level person. But it it I, I, so one my job for three years in the mayor's office was to go out into the community and help the directors of Head Start centers, drug treatment facilities, uh, community based organizations, and help them learn how to manage and lead these organizations. So I hired consultants and I worked in the community and in Harlem and Bedford Stuyvesant and, and Crown Heights and uh, around the Bronx and all over New York City. And I guess I've always been a curious person, but I just love meeting people and watching them and understanding, learning about their cultures. Uh, and, and then at the same time, uh, my first child was born, my daughter. And I remember going to the uh, hospital in Manhattan and seeing her in the incubator or the, not incubator, but in the, you know, the room where the newborns are and seeing her for the first time. And I was just taken, I, I was absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, and then when we went home from the hospital, I thought I've got to take, I, I don't know how to take a photograph <laughs> of her. So my friend from the, across the street on the Upper West Side came over and took her photograph. And I said, well, I'm not going to let this happen again. So <laughs> I bought a camera. This was in 1980-ish. Uh, I bought a camera and I didn't know how to use it. So I did some experimentation. And uh, then the New School for Social Research, uh, which was well known in New York at the time, had all kinds of courts, courses in the arts. And I began to study photography there. And from that moment on till this moment, uh, photography has become uh, my passion. Uh, my, my, I, people say, oh, that's your hobby. I said, no, it's not a hobby. <laughs> it's my passion. And I, so when I traveled around the world with my work, uh, I would hire guides and go off and uh, go to the Ganges River in Varanasi, India, where the Hindus were cremated and prayed and, and did photography, or to the for Forbidden City in Beijing or where. And my photography not only was... Uh, a wonderful way to discover and record the world, but became a, a, a vehicle to connect with people. So I would say, excuse me, may I take your photo? And they would either say no, 90% of the time they say yes. And so whether it's in with tribes in remote Africa or in uh, uh, Cambodia, uh, at Angkor Wat or in Manhattan or on Cape Cod. Uh, I learned to use my camera as a way to uh, introduce myself and to connect with people and cultures. And so it became a passion. Uh, and I've always been a very competitive person. <laughs> we and wouldn't have guessed. Would you, Roger? <laughs> so my, this competitive drive and this drive for achievement and recognition caused me to begin to say, well, how do I share my photography? And so I, uh, I, I uh, exhibited my prints in a gallery in uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka, and in... Uh, uh, Chennai and in India and uh, in New York and so on. So uh, uh, it's been a passion. Uh, when I'm in, get, when I'm doing my photography, nothing else in the world exists. It's an emotionally uh, involving uh, experience, and I forget everything else in the world, and connect with the person or the people that I'm. Uh, you know, I've slept on the ground for two weeks in Omo Valley, Ethiopia, living with tribes. Uh, and they're 
looking at me waking up at the sunrise <laughs> and, you know, uh, having dinner with the tribal chief and his wife and taking photos. And it's just, it's, it's a way that it's, I've learned to explore the world and uh, get close to people. And so I, it's a passion. Uh, uh, I've learned Photoshop and I now do most of my post-processing myself. Uh, I show, I sell my work and I'm right at this moment working with a, a online platform, a company called uh, Art Storefront. Uh, that works with artists and photographers to develop an absolutely state-of-the-art website and helps with marketing and selling and exhibiting. And so I'm right now working with them uh, to kind of expand and accelerate this process of showing and selling uh, my photography. So uh, it's an all in engaging, all inclusive process. Well, Doug, uh, we have a lot of people listening, and uh, I think very few of them have uh, sampled life the way you have. And uh, and I, you know, but I can see that we all have a pulse and uh, that there are some clear um, messages that that come from your story uh, as magnificent. And it's quite a story, Doug. I did. I'm learning some new things. And we had, <laughs> good <laughs> I want to see those those photos uh, personally, although we'll give the link as to where people might be able to see them soon on a website or, or get to them. But, you know, it seems to me that there are some critical messaging here that uh, I think most of the research on healthy longevity, successful aging talks about social connection, meaning and purpose. And it's clear that you you were able to find those and, and you already had such a collection of skills anyway that you brought to bear uh, on your transition so that you were able to flush out, you know, what your life was going to be like and how you were going to stay connected and with purpose. And, uh, you know, I, I that's kind of like a summary. I didn't want to summarize. I wanted you to summarize. Could you summarize for us what advice you would give anyone you know if they worked in a factory for 30 40 years and then that stopped or they were a ceo yeah. or they were a world traveler or whatever that what, what advice would you give them to uh to manage this transition to stay healthy of course uh both emotionally psychologically as well as physical physically right. so what what would you what, what advice would you give well first of all roger I want to be clear that for about 18, 12 to 18 months after I, my career came to an abrupt end, I went through a very challenging time emotionally and psychologically uh, because I hadn't made that transition to full-time photographer. I was, I was at loss. And I think that and I know that some of my friends were. So I think that people, I, I, that I don't want to make, I don't want to present this as though I, you know, I just kind of shifted gears overnight and made this transition. It was, it was difficult. Uh, but I, the, and I, I've watched colleagues of mine retire over the years. And those that did not do it successfully did not have a hobby or a passion or a pastime or, or something that they were interested in and committed to and engaged in. I, I can't tell you how many of my colleagues over the years said, well, I'm, I'm retiring. And I said, well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to move to Florida and play golf. <laughs> I thought, well, how many people have I known who were going to play golf their entire retired life? <laughs> you know, you know, purpose is so powerful um, a, a, as somebody who coaches one-on-one -on -one clients. And a lot of times when somebody is in a poor state of 
mental health and well-being, sometimes it's asking them, you know, what's your favorite song? And also what what music do you listen to? And then you'll find out, oh, well, I, you know, I like to play around on the guitar. It's like, okay, when's the last time you picked up the guitar? Or sometimes it's they like to cook or paint. And it's like, well, when's the last time you just started painting? It doesn't have to be beautiful, just trying something new. And so you're absolutely right. Some people don't think about, but I think creativity can be such, and purpose is such a powerful way to work through those those changes. I absolutely agree, Danielle. Agree, Danielle. And uh, I can tell you that there are a couple of uh, men in my men's group who... I think are still struggling because they don't have a purpose. Uh, but there are two or three others that uh, I, one of the men in my group is incredibly engaged. He's plays in a band. He's uh, plays the saxophone and the piano in a band. He is a bonsai expert. He's a musician. He's a, he teaches photography. Uh, he uh, he's a landscaper. He's uh, it's just incredible. Uh, but then there's another friend who is kind of I I I think uh, kind of depressed and doesn't have a purpose or or hasn't found it. Uh, so I so I my advice from my experience and my observation of others is. Do not plan to retire to play golf. You can't play golf for the rest of your life and you can't do it every day. And uh, you've got to have a purpose, uh, whether it's doing meals on wheels or uh, uh, some social action involvement or whatever it is, you've got to find something that is engaging and involving and meaningful. Um, and by the way, I'm still looking for another activity in my retirement in which I can, my photography is great for me, but it's not contributing to the betterment of the world in a significant way. So I've started a committee at the Copley Society of Art on inclusivity, diversity, and, ec and equity, equality. And in that role, I have this idea that I can work with Artists for Humanity or some other organization to work with teenagers in the inner city of Boston underprivileged teenagers to, to come have them come together, teach them photography, have them photograph their life, and then have and then work with them to uh, do a gallery exhibition at the Copley Society or another gallery and and do something like that as a way to use my photography to contribute to society. Uh, so, so you've got to find something in your retirement that you call Danielle purpose. And that's, I think that's the word that I use that has some meaning and value beyond yourself. A good friend of mine does Meals on Wheels. So he goes out and delivers meals to people, elderly people who are uh, sheltered in their homes or apartments or whatever. Uh, another of my friends is very involved in Habitat for Humanity and spends half his time helping build homes for uh, people. Uh, but you've got to find that purpose and that something that engages you uh, and I think in a way contributes to the betterment of the greater good. Uh, but people who don't, who can't find that or who haven't found it struggle in retirement. Wow. You, there's so many gems here, uh, Doug. Uh, we can't thank you enough. I mean, it's, it was a pleasure hearing about your uh, colorful and exotic life for sure. And but uh, when it really comes down to it, um, it uh, 
the messages, the gems that you've given us, the pearls, I guess that, that's a good term for it, of, you know, social connection and purpose and and that it wasn't easy. It was a it was a process, the transition. It's a process. Yeah. Don't expect to get it right away. You have to be a little patient. And, and this whole idea of the greater good when it comes to purpose, that is the most powerful type of purpose that you can can have. I went to a Jesuit school. They drill that into you. The greater good, you know, <laughs> social justice, all that sort of thing. So yes, I remember you went to Holy Cross. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I did. And well, my granddaughter is going to be a senior next year. <laughs> Must be very proud. How many grandkids do you have? You told me thirteen. Thirteen grandkids. <laughs> purpose there, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. I didn't answer your question about aging and how does one learn to maintain emotional, psychological, physical health as you age. And by the way, Roger, I learned something from you about this concept of resilience in as we age. And my best friend, who's my next door neighbor, who's in my men's group, uh, and is the one who does the Meals on Wheels, he's been dealing with cancer for 11 years. And it comes at it, it he, they uh, he goes to Dana Farber in Boston, and they put him on a new drug, and that kind of keeps it under control. And then it it reemerges, and it's been a roller coaster for him for eleven years. But he does Meals on Wheels. He's a great grandparent. He's a, he go he has he goes fishing often. He plays golf. He's in my men's group. Uh, but I said to him, I, I introduced this concept in my men's group of resilience. And I said, and, and Bill, you are the best example I know in my life. And uh, so he also has some other physical challenges, but he, he just, he plays golf three times a week. He goes fishing. He's with his grandchildren. Uh, and he's dealing with cancer. And uh, I think that I've learned from you and from Bill that, you know, I had knee replacement surgery, but I try to go to the gym five times a week, even when I don't want to. And I'm, I'm tired and I'm kind of lethargic and I didn't have a good night's sleep. I drag myself to the gym because I know that that physical exercise is not only a way to remain to kind of maintain my health as I age but it's better than antidepressants research has shown for for maintaining a positive mood and emotional health uh not to mention keeping my weight down and my uh moderately high blood pressure under control. And uh, so I've gotten into this, this kind of habit of going to the gym five times a week and watching my diet uh, very carefully. Uh, my wife says I'm, uh, you know, neurotic about it. <laughs> but it's kind of a challenge, you know. So I've, I, I've, I've got this book on uh, Long Live by Peter Atia, which is fantastic uh, about learning more about longevity and what to eat and what not to eat. And uh, right now I'm on an intermittent fast. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and I think learning about longevity and health and what I can do to help myself emotionally and psychologically and my photography and my family, those things I've discovered are now at the heart of successful aging. So, Danielle, we want to uh, make sure our listeners can uh, connect with the photography if uh, and whatever else though Doug has to, uh, to offer people going through this. They can find my work on Instagram at, at Doug Adams Photography. 
So thank you for asking. <laughs> Doug, can't thank you enough. And I get the pleasure of being able to see you face to face and chat. And you with likewise. <laughs> Lawrence, I'd like to see some of those photography, but uh, the, the photographs that you have and talk more about your life, a very colorful life. But I can't thank you enough for uh, taking the time to chat with us. And uh, we're going to we're going to make sure a lot of people know about Doug Adams. I greatly appreciate the opportunity and thank you so much for asking me to, to, to talk with you. You've been listening to Dr. Roger and friends, the bright side of longevity. If you like the show, please rate and review and be sure to click to follow.